Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Bart, how are you doing today? I'm great today, Peter. How about you? I'm good, thanks. Today on the show, we have Dr. Mariah Schnobrick uh, from Rudin Riddle. She's going to talk to us about the Therio conference that was just at Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, Dr. Schnobrick, a popular guest the first time we had her on. We had a blast with her, wanted to bring her back in. The Therio conference is interesting. It's uh, veterinarians with that specialty from all over the world coming together, putting their heads together, and uh, we're going to glean the footnotes out of it. So I'm excited. So if you like the show today, please remember to like like it, subscribe to it, and uh, share it with all your friends on Facebook and around the world. Make Peter and I famous. Yeah, but and who wouldn't like you? Uh, there's, I can give you a list. Yeah, I bet it's long. Yeah. So let's get on to the podcast. Dr. Mariah Schnobrick talking about the Theory of Conference. Mariah, welcome back to Stallside. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, welcome back, Mariah. Good to have you. Thanks, Bart. Happy to be here. So, Mariah, what you been up to? Well, I just got back from the annual Theriogenology Conference in Omaha, Nebraska. A bunch of us went out there, and it was really great just to see everyone with COVID lifting some of the bands of that and just getting to see people in person. It was a, It's a great conference. They have it every year. That's what annual. So, um, yep, every year. And um, just a lot of the theriogenologists and people with a repro focus out there just sharing information from the past year and reviews. So it was a great experience. One but, question. Yes. Yeah. Did you have lunch with Warren Buffett? I didn't. He didn't. I tried texting him. He wasn't interested. I, I tried, but no. Okay. Even. Well, you got no stock picks, so we're not interested anymore. <laughs> yeah. I can't. See what, next time you go, let me know. I'll give you his, give you his personal number. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. Theory mm. Conference, Omaha, okay. Nebraska. No Warren Buffett. So. No Warren Buffett. Tell us the latest. Okay, so I always look at these conferences as what can you take home, and I think there's a lot of really cool cases that are interesting that people have presented that maybe you haven't seen before that kind of highlight things that we can look at. There's also reviews, and then there's also some new research, so maybe we can break it up that way. Yep. Um, so I think for the pregnant mare, there was a really nice, and I can just kind of launch into these. Mm -hmm. sure. Some of these are a little more didactic and let's, we'll break it down for what people can take away from it at home. But one of the things that I liked was a study out of France looking at um, high drops and in the mare and what can you expect for her outcome if you diagnose high drops in the mare and then what is her subsequent fertility. For the audience, tell us about high drops. Yeah. So high High drops is a condition where basically there's excessive um, fluid, fetal fluid. There's two compartments in the in the pregnant conceptus or the baby and the membrane. So there's the allantoic fluid, then there's the amnion, and then there's the amniotic fluid, and then you have your baby. And if there's any kind of dysregulation in that fluid, you can start to accumulate a lot of fluid and and they break it up scientifically into either high drops of either one of those two fetal compartments. Um, but anyway, in general, what we tend to see in the horse is the most common time that you see it is at about eight months of gestation, a mare that's been ticking along normally, all of a sudden, one day she just looks huge. And she continues to enlarge to the point where you start to worry about a body wall rupture. That's usually when we see it. Sometimes it'll be later in gestation, but most of the time that we have excessive fluid accumulation, you don't really notice it until the mare is so big. And that's usually later in term. So what was helpful about this study, um, and a lot of us, P Peter, you see him, I'm sure you've seen him, Bart, in your career, yep. is you don't, you know, the owner is worried. What, what's going to happen here? What, you know, what or is she going to do it again? What are the chances? So what this study showed was that they looked at 34 mares that had presented with high drops, and they found that 90% of the mares survived, which I actually think is mm. higher yeah. a, a lot of times because it is a critical condition. If you don't refer that mare in right away, because of her excessive fluid, if the fl fetal fluids rupture, she can go into shock. So it's actually a dangerous condition for the mare. Yeah, because um, it's not just a little fluid. It's, we're, it's we're a talking lot of fluid. Gallons and gallons yeah. of, of fluid. And it's, it's spectacular. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I've, I've caught, like actually caught without spilling on the floor, over 150 litres. Right. And they reported up to 200. It just kept coming and coming. And this mare, she was just massive. And then, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's such a stress on them to have that fluid release. So that is one of the questions I get from clients all the time is that she has this condition. What happens in the future? 
right. you're here to tell us. Yeah, so so they found that 90% of the mares survived, um, and the main complications were just what you would expect, body wall tear, um, shock, hypovolemic shock, um, the hemorrhage as well, just because everything stretched so much. Um, they didn't go into as much the fetal outcome, which we know if they're because of the way the fetus matures in the mare, usually the fetal outcome is poor. I mean, um, it... 10, 15% tops. I mean, most of the times you're having to terminate it in order to save the mare. Um, and that actually might even be a high number, to be honest. Um, but they found that what they found that 75% of those mares that had high drops fold the next year, which I think answers a really nice question for us of, okay, this mare's had this incredible stress to her reproductive tract. What is she going to do next year? And is she going to do it again? Is this a genetic component? Or, And in general, we recommend that go ahead breed her back hopefully once she's involuted that her fertility should be good and to have 75 percent of them foaling the next year that's great information for us to have so when we're dealing with those cases and it was surprised me i, I think i would have that really surprises me mm -hmm. yeah i mean and, and people ask me that question too you know what happens this is what well, i say you can do it again and i've had them do it again the next year i've had them fold fine, never do it again. I've had them fall fine and yep. do it again, you know. And yep. the, the question is, for the high drops halantoas, the way I understand it is it's a placental abnormality, right? Right, correct. And the high drops amnion being a, a fetal abnormality. Right. And these things happen, but it, it does make you wonder, and that's why this is such good information that somebody yes. has sat back and looked at the numbers and said, hey, this is worth going through this with this mare because we have a very good chance of yep. a live mare and we have a very good chance of her falling next year. Yep. And I think the key thing here is catching it early. So mm -hmm. one of the things you'll hear me say again and again is that these late gestation um, pregnancy exams are so important because you're catching things early enough that you can make a decision either that you need to terminate the pregnancy before it goes so far. Because there are hard drops cases, especially in a thoroughbred, if you have a body wall tear, her reproductive career is likely over because she can't foal again and she has to carry her own. Mm. Um, so catching it early before those sequela happens is really important. Yeah, um, And probably part of why their outcome was as good as it was, because for those of us that have seen the really late term um, high drops, they can progress into some pretty bad things for the mayor. Well, that's good to know, too, though, to, to advise clients and, and talk to people, because if you know that 75% of them are getting in full the next year, because right. I think a lot of us were reluctant to breed those mares back yep. that year because mm -hmm. it is such a dramatic and you I just imagine that uterus being stretched like that yep and, and yep. how it takes that so that's a really good number to have that's yep. good yeah I thought it was I thought it was it was good information to have and and this kind of piggybacks onto one of the other things that was sort of a, a persistent theme is just the evaluation of these mares in late gestation and Dr. Lou from Haggards did a very nice job presenting a study where they looked at evaluating the cervix as well as the placenta. So I think for those of us who look at mares in late gestation, one of the common findings that or things that we evaluate is what's called the C-tup or the combined thickness of the uterus and placenta. And when there's inflammation, that will thicken. And that can be a sign for us, those of us that are ultrasounding and evaluating it, that something's wrong and we may need to initiate treatment or follow up again. And so what Dr. Liu had looked at was by evaluating evaluating both the cervix and the CTUP, was that better able to predict the outcome? As in, we're constantly looking for ways that we can diagnose that something's wrong with this pregnancy and that justifying our intervention, whether it's antibiotics, regimate, anti-inflammatories. And she found that by looking at both the cervix and the CTUP, that they were better able to predict the outcome in, in terms of identifying an issue. And I think this is key. And, and Stephanie Buka, someone who had looked at a lot of the um, initial work at the cervix, there are problems with any of these. Um, I think as a group of theriogenologists and neonatologists, we're always looking for something. What in the pregnancy or in the mare's blood tells us something's wrong so that we can initiate treatment? And for those of us that had the nocardiform, um, placentitis is a couple years ago, that didn't present quite normal. 
normally because you weren't always finding it on transrectal, but more on transabdominal. Right. And so we don't really have a gold standard of if you draw blood and look at some of the inflammatory mediators like the mare's white cell count or the serum amyloid A, it doesn't tell you that she has a raging infection in her uterus. It doesn't always tell you that. Just as these ultrasound exams don't always tell you definitively that there's a problem. But by using a combination of means, we probably are getting a better assessment of these pregnancies. And so Dr. Liu's work was good um, in introducing a new way of looking at the cervix and the CTEP. There was also a case that came out of our group that Dr. Alexander presented where we had diagnosed, and Peter and I actually worked on this case together, um, at about 213 days of gestation, we realized the mare had ruptured her amnion. And she had no external signs of, of an issue. There was no wax, no marker that there was an issue. And the only way we found that out was on routine ultrasound. So those are things that just keep highlighting that we need to keep looking. And I think those, both the transabdominal and the transrectal exam are really important, especially in these mares that we want to get a better handle um, of what's going on. Yeah, because you're, you're right. It's easy to miss stuff and get get a false negative. But on the, on the flip side, I think if you're only doing one part of those exams, I've seen a lot of what I thought were false positives. Absolutely. And, and we overtreat horses, and that's not good either. That's absolutely right. And I think one of the things that we always have to think about with ultrasound is it's very user-dependent. So you can alter your angle and get a much different measurement, or there may be local pockets that are different that you're either going to miss or interpret incorrectly. So it comes with with experience. What were you going to say, Peter? Yeah, I was going to say, well, that comes down to like re repeating the exam, right? Because yes. you'd like to think that even if your hold, hold on the probe was a little bit different, you'd still spot the trend. Absolutely. Because even if your measurement was greater all the way through because of your technique, you would still spot the trend when, when things are getting bigger. And, and for the listeners at home, that's what really hammers home the point is that you just these are all building blocks of information, yep. right? And you can't rely on one thing. Everybody's looking for the holy grail of does my mare have placentitis? Mm -hmm. And it can be so covert. It can yes. be so sneaky. And that mare with the ruptured amnion, I mean, yeah, you'd walk up to her and think nothing was wrong. And yep. your ultrasounder and you go, I carumba, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on in here? And, yep. you know, she had the end that she had, yep. right? But that was a particularly abnormal pregnancy. I'd never seen, seen one like that before. Right. And it was really only repeated exams yep. on your part that yep. actually picked that up. Yep. And we actually saw kind of a response to treatment in some cases. And at one point, we actually discontinued the antibiotics because we didn't feel that they were making a difference in what the pathology was. And that foal was born with contracts, yeah. serious angular limb deformities. So I, I think it's interesting, you know, and um, I agree. There is a, there's a subjective nature to it that it would be really nice if we could look at some of the, and there's certainly work being done um, in a lot of the more academic centers that are looking at things like cytokines and um, other markers in the blood that we may be able to pick it up. But again, none of it's a perfect catch-all. So working yep. with your veterinarian and making sure, again, these conferences help us evaluate are these things useful or not and so it's 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 a forefront that that is being pushed and needs to be investigated further for sure for the audience you mentioned cytokines <coughs> and that's something that you read from time to time sure in the news what are cytokines so cytokines are um, they're small molecules that are released and they basically um, th they're produced in response to inflammation from different stimuluses. If you look within just the uterus, the cytokines will be released from the cells and they can cause um, they basically help to modulate either the immune system, um, blood flow, they can have lots of different effects. Um, so for example, there are cytokines like IL-1 that might be very inflammatory. And what that does is it causes neutrophils to come into the site to clean up bacteria, let's say. So um, for example, you have an increase in IL-1 after breeding. And Dr. Carly Fedorka did a beautiful um, review of these cytokines, um, looking at which ones are elevated elevated in, in a normal mare versus a mare that has a lot of problems with fluid, fluid accumulation, or we call that a susceptible mare because she's susceptible to post-mating induced endometritis. She pools fluid. So in that mare at about six hours, 
The IL-1 is increased and that's bringing in neutrophils or different cell types as, as well as causing nitrous oxide release, which may be causing vasodilation and smooth muscle relaxation. But the change in those cytokine patterns help identify mares that are able to handle inflammation versus not. So if IL-1 is increased, she's having a pro-inflammatory response or recruiting these white cells or inflammatory cells to the site, whereas there are cytokines like IL-10 that you may hear about in the literature, and that actually may have some dampening effects, so it may decrease the number of neutrophils coming. So honestly, it's I think for a lot of us, the talk about cytokines is sort of on another level that I honestly feel uncomfortable talking about some... at you know, in great depth because there's still so much that we're learning. But what is helpful from a research standpoint is understanding the differences and if there are things that can change that. So, for example, in Carly's review, she talked about if you have IL-1 increase, that that's sort of pro-inflammatory. And if you have an increase in IL-10 because that dampens the immune response, that's actually helpful. So things that, looking through the literature, increase... IL-10 would actually help dampen the immune response. And there's certain NSAIDs like firecoxib, um, certain steroids that help promote that type of cytokine profile. And that's sort of where we take the science to our practical um, application in mare breeding. So we know for example, in the non-pregnant mare, that after she's bred, some mares are going to have a very robust inflammatory response. They're going to pool fluid. Their uterus is going to get saggy. They're not going to look great, whereas other mares might handle that insult, and the next day they look fine. So from research on these cytokines and looking at what types of anti-inflammatories you can use, you can sort of be a little bit smart about what you're doing. And, and based on Carly's work review and standing on the work of a lot of others, um, it looks like there's a huge role at six hours of using something like an ecbolic agent, which would be oxytocin, um, estromate, that help clear out all those cytokines and inflammatory mediators and white cells, um, as well as lavage. And that's, that's why we have post-breeding lavages, because we're trying to help augment these mares that have these abnormal cytokine profiles and response to inflammation. Um, and that's where we can kind of pull it in and use it. If so, that helps explain. Yeah. <laughs> That's my stab at it. You, so, go, you might be able to explain it better, Peter. So, so basically, this is how sales talk to each other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ooh. I'll write it's, that down. It's been a very uncommon situation where I use less words and somebody else to say the same thing. <laughs> you but heard it, it first on yeah. stall side. <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, it helps you. If you go into that, then it helps you pick what you're going to be treating your mare with. And the takeaway from that, she did a beautiful review. I thought that was so cool. And we had had um, interns come to this conference, and I think what everyone was really excited about was realizing how critical that six-hour post-breeding window is for you to, to administer treatments that are going to change the outcome for this mare. And so, you know, a lot of us use post-breeding lavages or talk about it, and it might even just be the administration of oxytocin or something like that. But those things that your vet is trying to do are really helpful and make a big difference in the pregnancy outcome. And I think that's something people may have trouble understanding understanding is why the veterinarian is so focused on coming back to that mare so many times in that initial period right. because you've got a relatively short time to set that uterus up yep. to be a, a um, facilitative environment for that embryo when it drops in. Right. You don't have that many days. That's correct. Yep, exactly. And 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 as as we know, the embryo is not coming down until five and a half, six days. So we have this window to try to optimize that environment. So if you come back 24 hours after breeding and the mare has three, you know, large volumes of fluid in there, you still have time to try to address that. Now, most, a lot of mares are, are able to handle that inflammation. So it's not every mare, but I do think in our thoroughbred mares, um, whether it's confirmation, genetics, um, you know, it's a it's a debate on how many actually truly need that. Um, one of the things that's kind of fun at these conferences is you actually talk to a lot of people from other countries, and it's not so much the talks as much as the side conversations that you mm -hmm. learn a lot about. So I did ask someone who's from Australia, why do you think it is? Because it has been shown in a couple studies that the Australian thoroughbred population seems to be able to tolerate certain things better, maybe their per cycle pregnancy rate. Um, they just, 
seem to be, and this is subjective, but kind of more fertile based if you compared a lot of the studies between the United States and Australia. And one of the things that they had mentioned was the management mm -hmm. and that those mayors are out all the time. Um, and that's something that we don't do. There, a lot of these mayors are locked up. They're locked up intermittently. They have a full, you know, obviously if the foal's injured, they're going to lock, they're going to stall, restrict the mayor. But that was another thing that came through was just how important exercise is for these mayors. And that was something that I hadn't, because I've never been to Australia, you know, to recognize about their management. That may be something that's simple that we can take you know, especially for these sub-fertile mares, how important it is to get them moving around. Mm. Well, we, we, we've seen that when you have a, a foal that's locked in the stall or, or, or whatnot. Absolutely. And those mares are so much tougher to get yeah. pregnant. And I think that's a climate thing too, because around here, I mean, winter is winter, right? It's pretty harsh, but yep. in, in those parts of the world, um, you can have the horses out the whole time. And exactly. they do move the whole time. And I think right. there's... Yeah, a lot more of a uh, production animal sort of approach yep. to the to the the mares. They're looked on to some degree as a herd, and how do you manage the herd? Well, you get the herd out and get the herd moving. Yep, yep, yeah. So. Um Anything else on the pregnant mare that was of interest to you? So one of the other um, things that was that regarding the pregnant mare that was that was interesting and I think applicable for all of us was um, Haggard's had done a study with the Zoetis core vaccine, looking at the antibodies that the foals received from vaccine, vaccinated mares, and they showed that the mares. Um, after foaling at about four months, the level of antibodies that they should have to rabies is actually a little lower than we might have thought. So the AAP recommends vaccinating foals for rabies at four to six months, but it looked like based on their work that we really should be looking around four months um, of of age to do that and someone brought up the question well how important is rabies i mean honestly do horses really get rabies and actually they definitely do because if you think of their exposure to wildlife it's it's a problem so how do you how effective do you think that would be in a in a three four month old foal getting vaccinated shouldn't be an issue right yeah i, I fully expect the the majority of foals to mount a good response because when if you're looking at vaccination from like a risk-based standpoint you can actually vaccinate down to three months with yep. some things those foals are immune competent and can develop a good response yep down to that i think the waning of maternal antibodies has sort of pushed vaccination back in a lot of situations to yeah. six months because we're unsure when that happens. Right. And for some conditions, that's not really going to matter that much. But rabies doesn't take any prisoners, and <laughs> it's a zoonotic Zoonotic, disease, right? exactly. I mean, so the, the last thing you'd ever want is a person to get exposed to a horse. And while that hasn't happened, I mean, it hasn't happened until it's happened. Right, exactly. So this exactly. is actually a gap in the protection for rabies that the study has uncovered, and I think that's very valuable. Yep. And, and you're, you're right. The likelihood of, cons of infection is, is low. Yes. The consequence right. of infection is, exactly. is, is, is bad. Yes. And if, if you're going to be vaccinating anyway... Yep. You know, so it'll be interesting to see if the AP re revises their Yeah, their based on that. But it was, an, it was great to have them look at that, those specifically, those antibodies in that age group because mm -hmm. it helps guide our recommendations. Um, so other things that were helpful, I think one of the nice things that was reviewed and has been a push in all fronts of our medicine is trying to get away from some of the antibiotic, overuse of antibiotics. That's not anything new. Yeah. Um, and there were a couple really nice reviews over things that can be used. Um, and and um, I think one of the things that's important, um, kind of mixing the, the topics that were brought up with kind of common sense and what do you take home from that, is that one of the major causes of endometritis, which is one of our biggest issues, is confirmation, health of the mare. And that gets emphasized every single conference. Um, and so if you're a farm that is dealing with a lot of endometritis and a lot of, or you have one mare that that's the issue, don't forget that you really have to look at the metabolic status of that mare the confirmation there was a really nice discussion on reproductive surgeries after foaling in the mare and you'd be surprised at how many mares whether it's this is the year they're old enough that their tract sort of pulls in a certain way that they start urine pooling cervical damage if you don't fix those things you will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on antibiotic treatment for an infection that's just going to keep happening. So I think that was an important um, topic. And then the other thing we've talked about is biofilm in the mare's uterus um, and how our antibiotics 
cannot work if we have a biofilm, which for those of you who don't, Pierre, you want to, so I don't talk so much, you want to talk about biofilms or you want me to? <laughs> no, that's fine. No, biofilm, essentially um, biofilm is bacteria just don't exist you know, in isolation. I mean, right. they can form a little village, for want of a better right. word. And the structure that that bacteria forms actually provides protection for the colony. Right. And they secrete substances which actually shield the colony from attack from the outside. Right. So they can become resistant as a group to right. antibacterials and some of the uh, agents that we put against them to actually disrupt that colony. So it's actually a, a good model for how to work together. Right. Exactly. Perhaps people can learn from bacteria <laughs> exactly. that together we are stronger. Together we are stronger. What a novel approach. Um, but, yeah, so, the, so this biofilm is a real problem. And one of the things about effective treatment is trying to identify what gets rid of the biofilm so that you can treat it effectively. And um, there was a good review on some of the things that we commonly use, like DMSO. I'm just going to list these so that you guys have heard it. DMSO, tricide, acetylcysteine, hydrogen peroxide, and betadine. And what's nice about some of these is not only do they disrupt the biofilm, but some of them actually have antimicrobial properties. So um, my husband's an engineer and he always says, yeah, whenever we have really bad biofilm in metal pipes, we use hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. because it's great because it breaks down into oxygen and water. So you don't have these residues and it has, you know, it's very effective. What's important to remember about all of these is that at different concentrations, they can actually be pretty damaging to the uterus. But what's helpful in knowing what to use, and this was brought up, is that there are biofilm assays, and there are our lab runs them. So if you have a sample that you want to submit, we did a retrospective study that was introduced at AAP where we talked about what isolates were grown and which agents were most effective, and it turned out that betadine povidone iodine solution was the most effective, which is very inexpensive. And so it just reminds us that when we have an infection, we don't necessarily need to go to a $700 treatment plan. Something as simple as betadine lavages may be able to resolve and even more effectively resolve an infection with biofilm. And but a targeted approach, you're allowed to have a targeted approach from your mare by using those biofilm assays. But you'd have to be um, pretty <coughs> strong on the concentration from a point of view of being careful with that concentration Absolutely. because just because a little is good, it doesn't mean a lot is better because... That's exactly right. right. Yep. So yep. what would be the downstream effects of too much? And we've seen these mares. So sometimes people have brought it up to want, you know, up to 5% solution povidone iodine. You can have scalding adhesions, even with hydrogen peroxide and DMSO. Too much can cause some serious damage and the mares and the metrium does not recover well from scarring. So over all do no harm, but I think it's important for, as the veterinarians, we're always checking what our concentrations are. And for povidone iodine, the concentration that's supposed to be the most effective for a lot of these bacteria is actually lower than much higher. So 0.05 to 0.1 is thought to be more effective than 1% in some cases. So that's kind of interesting. Because mm -hmm. your ability to generate a deleterious <coughs> inflammatory response would be massive with too high a concentration of these agents because, again, Absolutely. a little is good, a lot is bad. And just picking up a point that you made earlier about anatomical defects, so many of these mares, they get so many drugs that are never going to work because the mare can't clean herself or her seals aren't right. I mean, we get I may get a full watch mare in, yep. in a raging ascending placentitis, and she's got a hole in the castle that you can stick your finger through. Right. And that is just like a basic thing that was missed is that, what chance do we have when one of the main seals is broken? Absolutely. So it just behoves everybody to do the basics well, Correct. work on the defects, make sure the mare clears well, and then if yep. there's an infection in there, go after it in a judicious fashion. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it – so those those were um, – and then one of the other um, – uh, agents that came up for discussion was an immune modulator, which is settle or XDIM. You may have heard of it. And basically, those have been shown in some mares. Again, if you're looking for something that's a non antibiotic um, treatment, these are also appealing particularly in mares that have mixed infections, because if we just treat her with one antibiotic, that may get part of the infection, but not the whole thing, when instead you're really trying to get the mare to have a more robust 
response overall. And so um, those were both products that had shown they basically um, induce a particular type of immune response that helps the mare um, recover some infection. I know the Settle product was done in a postpartum study where they gave it at seven days and helped involution a little bit. Um, there's also been studies post-breeding to show um, that it that it can have a good immune modulating effect that may increase pregnancy outcome. I will say that some of those do cause a fever. So in my hands, I've been a little bit hesitant on some of them to use. But mm. it's these are all things in our arsenal to think about. And you may hear your veterinarian talking about them more, as well as PRP. That was another mm another product that, that's the classic example of a little what is bad for you is good for you because for the audience um this product that mariah's talking about is actually a, a cell wall fragment from mycobacterium and that's the organisms which cause tuberculosis so you're not to fear that because um while that's a bad disease this product has been attenuated so that the part that causes the vigorous immune response against that organism has been separated out and actually is very, very useful. And it does induce a potent immune response. And you're right, it does cause a fever in some situations, but that says, hey, the body's noticed it. Yeah. And you're creating an environment where the mare fixes herself because she actually goes away from that I don't care anymore to mount that vigorous immune response. And without that immune response, no amount of drugs are going to help. Right, right, exactly. So So what else did you do over there besides eat really good steak? <laughs> there was a lot of steak. <laughs> <laughs> we um, you know, just caught up on sleep. Well, yeah, I know, but there must have been something <laughs> Of a more I think she's talking. No, I think no, she's no, I've been sworn to secrecy uncovered. on that the, last the night. Scottish <laughs> red shade is coming back out. This this conference was about reproduction. It so was, Mariah, I've already done that. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, you're you're you're, you're, you're proven. You're proven. I'm proven. Yeah. So we talked a lot about pregnant mare. Mm -hmm. Anything else uh, in the horse world? Um, so um, other kind of takeaways that I think are are helpful, especially when I'm thinking about our audience, um, mare owners, breeders. Um, one was um, just the incidence of reproductive problems in non-pregnant mares. And this was a review done um, out of CSU. And they found that, and I'm just going to list them, but I think it's important to, to kind of hear these numbers to realize how significant these problems are. Because you may hear some buzzwords, but how often is that truly an issue? So um, this was a study done by... Um, Pat McHugh's group at Colorado State, and they found that persistent luteal tissue after giving estromate was about 7 to 10%. And I think that's really interesting because I do see that. We give prostaglandin, we assume the mare is going to come in, and it doesn't happen as readily as we expect. And so I think sometimes that's considered a failure of our treatment, but to know that, that is, that's a real number that happens and sort of to be aware of that. And there are things you can do to combat that, like giving a second dose mm -hmm. of a prostaglandin land in the next day, especially if you're in a very tight window of breeding, that may be worth considering. 5% um, hemorrhagic follicles, um, those are those follicles that don't ovulate. Blocked oviducts was about 3.2%, so just remembering that that's a very low number. We talk about it a lot. There's a lot of treatments <laughs> for oviducts. Well, um, when we can't find anything else, yeah. that's and what we that's what we do. And yeah, but that might be a low number. But it's very but, significant. But that's, that might yeah. be the profit for the year for that farm. That's exactly right. right. 3% actually yeah. surprises me that it's that high. If yeah. you're 100% yeah. of the 3%, it's really important. It's very high. And don't forget that we could that is probably bilateral blockage. Right. There may be exactly. some cases yep. of gonna, subfertility. Yep. And actually, Dr. Kivi Nemi Moore presented a case in which they had a mare, and this is not to scare people, but mesoprostol is the treatment that we use a lot of time on farm for blocked oviducts. You guys may have heard of that. And she actually reported a case where they had used a higher dose of mesoprostol, and the mare actually had a hypovolemic shock episode. So it's not without risk, but again, just knowing it's a low incidence, it is a problem. Um, and interestingly, there were two other studies where they lasered or injected a, um, uh, like a, 
polymer plastic into the oviducts to cause infertility. And so this is looking at wild horse populations. They're mm. now looking at ablating the oviduct or getting rid of the oviduct or sort of filling it with stuff as a way to cause infertility. So wow. it just highlights that this is something, you know, it's one of those things that we need to think about in the subfertile or infertile mare. Um, and then endometritis was 21%. Um, which is, again, emphasizing that that is our biggest issue. Um, and cysts were about 15%. And then another thing that was kind of neat that came out of that study is that they found that mares that had a tight cervix or failure to relax the cervix, 75% of those mares went on to have post-mating-induced endometritis, so issues with uterine clearance. Not surprising, but knowing that if you have a cervic cervical issues, you're likely going to need some more aggressive management around breeding. So you mentioned that tight cervix. What is the classic mare? presentation for that tight cervix? It's, it would be an older maiden mare usually that's been under a lot of times we see performance mares not necessarily thoroughbreds because if they're in the breeding population they're usually younger but those older warm blood mares they've been given regimate or different treatments and their cervix does not relax and when they have that inflammatory response all those cytokines, nitrous oxide, those things are trapped in the uterus and it fails to evacuate. And yeah. so that it kind of snowballs on itself. Um, People just couldn't understand that. I've been in a situation, I'm trying to breed this 15 to 16 year old mare, oh, they yeah. couldn't understand why is she going to be difficult? This uterus is brand new. <laughs> It's, oh, yeah, it's right. Never it's been in showroom used. condition. I know. You know, admittedly, it's the 1985 model, but it's got three <laughs> miles on it. And it just, yeah, they're yes. shot. And the other thing is, is that she's had repeated insults exactly. to that uterus with cyclicity. That's exactly and right. And when you're pregnant, you're not cycling, right? That's but exactly But when you're not right. pregnant, you are cycling. So every time, she, what opening there is, all the junk gets in there and she just cyclically insults her endometrium yep. with a drum tight cervix and people just don't understand. It's the junk in the trunk junk. problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like Thanks for taking us down that road, Bart. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't leave it. Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah, we, we'll just stand on the corner. You can drive that one. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah, you are done. You're totally done. And we are done with you. Oh, uh, so it. as a wrap-up, Mariah, what was the number one thing you took away from Serio 2021? Mm, I would say um, have fun with your friends, keep in touch with your colleagues, and keep learning. I'm yep. And, no, if a and if there's Honestly. a reproduction involved, that's a bonus. And that's a bonus. But no, I mean, there's so many great talks. And honestly, um, it, it always seems like a continuum to me. So each presentation is building on years past. It's hard. I think the rabies thing is really yeah. a concrete, nice, nice body of research for us. I think some of the stuff has been presented before, but is helpful. Um, and I would encourage if you have the time to look up, if you're interested in reproduction, they have the abstracts are short and you can get a lot out of looking up that manual for theriogenology. So this is, I'm going to give them a plug. It's a great society. Um, but these abstracts are great. And if you're interested, email me. I can forward you stuff. But, yeah, I think it was a great conference. It always is. Um, and one other – can I add one more other little thing? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that was cool that was presented was a case that was a thoroughbred mare that was looked at under a breeding soundness exam. And they um, had been checked by another vet under our routine breeding soundness exam. So ovaries, transrectal palpation, and cervix all appeared normal. And then she was referred to another vet. And then looking at her, it looked as though the entire uterus basically had not developed. So even though she had sort of a normal feel to the uterus, the inside of the uterus was not normal. And I think this highlights and it's probably something we need to think about is do we do the best for our clients with our routine BSC? It's a fine line between the sellers and the buyers and trying to pass a mare through that most likely won't have an issue. But this was a mare I think that highlighted to me that we, you know, we, are we doing due diligence? Because, you know, the, they're, they can be very expensive and she still would have passed by our standard means what a breeding soundness exam was, but she was absolutely not sound for yeah, breeding. Yeah, and I think that's quite a misnomer at sale time yeah. when it's called a breeding soundness evaluation. You spec she has a cervix, you put your hand in there, she's got two ovaries. Yep. It doesn't say anything about the competence of anything you've seen and felt Correct. for yep. that act. And so that is a complete misnomer because a breeding soundness exam, yep. as you know, yep. as a serogenologist, is a very comprehensive exam right. involving a much more rigorous examination of the genital tract. Yep. So that's, that's a... 
that's a terminology that has to change at yeah. sale time. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Yeah, because it's a it's a brief exam. Yep. It really is. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like a genital exam. Yes, she has some. <laughs> but it says nothing about whether exactly. it works or not. Function. And there and the thing is that there are subtleties that someone like bar yourself, you you would pick up. But uh, somebody else might not, and also when you evaluate them. So if you evaluate them in winter versus when they're starting to cycle and have uterine secretions that can't get out, that's a different mm-hmm. animal. You know, yeah. so it's just, I don't know, that was interesting. So lots of cool, interesting stuff, and um, we'll continue to learn. Mariah, we were always <laughs> encouraged by your enthusiasm for your specialties. <laughs> Thank you. So it was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Always a thrill. Thank yeah, you, guys. I agree. Thank you. So thanks for coming in. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mariah. It's been great. Thanks for listening. <laughs> and that's Stall Side. We'll see you next time. the podcast. Root and Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy has a relatively small marketing budget, especially when you compare us with our competitors. I understand that marketing is important, but telling people that you exist and what you do and why your products or services are different is a must. I thought about what makes us unique, and I realized I wanted to give people something of real value. And that's how the podcast idea evolved. I wanted to use the money we had set aside for marketing, not to tell people who we are, but rather to show them, to open up how we do things and give something of value at the same time. The content of this podcast is designed to do exactly that. It's not going to serve as a shameless plug for pharmacy products or services. We want you to know who we are, that quality is uncompromised, that we care about people and their animals. If there are specific topics that you would like us to cover or guests that you would like to hear from, please email us at stallside at rrvp.com. Hope you enjoy the show. Just one more note, nothing that we talk about here today should be construed as veterinary advice. That's why you have a relationship with your own veterinarian. Thank you for listening.